The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. It's a pretty interesting river that gives you a lot of the city, but yet it gives you an opportunity to experience kind of a natural world. If it weighs a certain amount, we'll put a, a radio transmitter on the back, and that will help us observe them as well. This inn has sat in four countries and never changed its location. And that's pretty remarkable to think about. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Everyone's very familiar with the Riverwalk in town, and that's very nice. It has restaurants and hotels, and very good for tourism. But this is also another section of the river. It's the very same river, but a much, much different setting, a much more natural setting. We couldn't have asked for a better day to be on the river. Sun's not shining, a little overcast, not as hot, wonderful. The Mission Reach Trail includes eight miles of paddling trails, as well as 15 miles of hiking and biking trails. It's a pretty interesting river that gives you a lot of the city, but yet it gives you an opportunity to experience um, kind of a natural world. Because the grass and the, the vegetation is growing up around the river, it gives you the impression that you're not actually in the city, but you're right in the middle of the city. Woo! We're gonna keep moving on down, guys. We're gonna keep moving. to make it. This is the first time I've been in a kayak. Oh, we're gonna make it. We're gonna make it. Yes, this is the first time I've uh, kayaked. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, I'm always down to do new things. Pretty fun. <laughs> that was cool. Come on. Yeah. I have not paddled this. This is my first time on this river. It's really fun, actually. The little shoots that were going down. You get stuck every now and then. Make sure not to try to hit the side. Okay. Oh, there we go. We moving again. And then when you get down, it's like, whew, we made it. <laughs> it's pretty fun, like riding down the water and going down the shoots. The shoots were like the best part. I thought. We did it. Yeah, it was just a really great experience just going down the river. I couldn't even tell that I was in the city because I see houses on the side and things like that, but it was completely silent. You could hear the birds chirping, the ducks quacking and everything like that. Yeah, buddy. Because I live in the city and I just always see how chaotic it is and everything is just so loud and noisy. And it's just good to connect with nature and just be peaceful and just relax and take everything in. Well, that was good, boy. Right, that was the best one yet. It's vitally important. If we are ever gonna capture and rekindle our youth um, with the natural world, um, we've gotta be able to make it accessible. Oh my God. It's a pure environment, and that's what we're trying to get the kids to hopefully reconnect with. This is floating. 
just takes you to a different place. Three, two, one, go. And then just let that hand go. Yep, you're okay, you're okay. I'm okay. And there he goes. He gave you a little goodbye kiss. <laughs> you did it! Thank you, Tony! Yep. Yep. <laughs> what an awesome experience! Yeah, of course. <laughs> what an awesome experience! Alicia Cavazos has just released a green jay back into the wild. Just 20 minutes earlier, this bird was captured in her backyard as part of a new study taking place in South Texas. Well, that's good. Means he's feisty. Means he's alert. That's what we want to see. We're looking at uh, the home range of green jays in urban areas to determine if they're kind of staying in certain backyards or if they're moving around. We just don't know a lot about what they're doing in urban areas. The green jay occurs from South America north to Texas. In North and Central America, the bird's range extends from Honduras north through Mexico and into the brushlands of South Just Texas. The <laughs> There's like eight of them. We don't know a lot about green jays, first of all, so it's, it's important to know what they're doing if we want to be able to manage for them. And we want to manage for them because we have a lot of bird watchers that come into the valley, and one of the species that they really want to see are green jays. Oh yeah, it looks hungry. It's just cool. A lot of them are camouflage or blending in, but that one really pops out. The Rio Grande Valley is, I think, the third fastest growing urban area in the country. It's expanding at a rapid rate. A lot of urbanization, a lot of habitat change is going on. And so these birds have been able to adapt to a certain extent. In order to understand how green jays are adapting to the rapidly changing environment of the valley, Tony plans to trap, tag, and track up to 10 birds a year. Well, Tony brought this cage to me about a week and a half ago and had me set it up here under the shade. Donna McCowan's yard in Harlingen is a paradise for birds of all kinds. With the cage door open, we were putting corn and peanuts in it. So the birds would get used to it and just assume it's supposed to be there and they had no problem getting in and out of it. This morning, we're going to close the top of it and watch and wait for the birds to show up. Usually what I find is it takes one bird to be in the trap, and mm -hmm. then once that happens, all the other birds are like, oh, I can just go right in. Oh, you okay. Know? There's one. He goes, wait a minute, this is how I got in before. <laughs> <laughs> We're setting the traps up in areas where we know that green jays occur. Okay, those peanuts should be pretty irresistible. So now we're waiting around for them to figure out, okay, this is where the food is and that's how I get to it. And then they shouldn't just walk into the trap and, and to get the food. Almost. That's where he went long ago. On the other side. side. They're a jay, so they're a smart, you know, intelligent bird. There you go. And inquisitive. You, you watch them and they're jumping around. They're looking at different <laughs> things. They're, they're investigating stuff and they're, they're fun to watch. <laughs> he said, no, not yet. We've got doves, we've got crackles. We've had a rabbit go in. So far today, we, we haven't had a ton of luck, but we're hopeful. Hey, Alicia, uh, we're, we're gonna head over to your place now, okay? So uh, get ready, we're coming. After an hour of waiting without much success, Tony decides it's time to check on another trap he has set up about 15 miles down the road in San Benito. The green jays come to my yard all the time. So I offered my house to Parks and Wildlife so they can do this study. I'm just so excited because I love the green jays. As you can see, I'm wearing my lucky green jay shirt. <laughs> uh, we had some green jays coming in and you know investigating it, but they didn't go in yet. A couple of minutes ago, Donna McCown, whose house that we were at earlier, uh, just let me know that she did get a green jay in her trap. I finally caught the green jay. So we're gonna head over there now and process that bird. This is typical urban ecology. You're, you're bopping between places pretty frequently, trying to get to the, the animals you need to get to uh, as fast as possible. All right, so we got the bird in the trap. It, it went in, and we're just gonna reach through the top and grab it. There you go. All right, so there's our bird. We'll put a color band on the bird, and we'll put a silver band on the bird. If we see the bird running around, we can at least look at the leg and say, okay, it has a color band on it, and I know what individual bird that is. So this is on the 
left leg. So we'll take a, a wing measurement, 116. 116 for yep. wing cord. Yep, a tail measurement, 132. 132. If it weighs a certain amount, so that's 91. We'll put a, a radio transmitter on the back and that will help us observe them as well. So we're gonna put it right about there. The radio is gonna fall off before the radio dies. Uh, and that's good. We get our data that we need, the transmitter falls off and the bird goes about its life as normal. So Donna, the way you're gonna release it mm -hmm. is you're gonna put two fingers over the head like this and mm -hmm. you're gonna control the bird like this. I think initially it thought, oh no, this is it. Uh, this is how I get eaten. And you know, after it doesn't get eaten right away, it probably is just thinking, how do I escape? Okay. And we're gonna let them go pretty much right into this tree here. Okay. 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 And so I'm sure they'll give you a count of, oh. I'm sorry. He was ready to go. So gonna, <laughs> I'm sorry. He's right here. He's picking at his bands. Those are new things. So he's trying to figure out what they are and are they gonna stay there or do I get rid of them? <laughs> gotta go back to Alicia's house. Uh, she got a bird as we were on our way here. So now we're gonna go there and, and transmit her that bird. Um, they're adaptable. That's one of the reasons why we find them in urban areas, but we don't really know what they're doing to be able to adapt. Is it their diet? Are they able to adapt to different kinds of plants that they normally wouldn't use? The hope of this project, the goal, is to come up with some habitat recommendations that we can go to landowners and say, listen, green jays are in the area. We all like green jays. They're colorful birds, they're cool birds. All you need to do is X, Y, and Z, and you'll get green jays in your yard. And that is the ultimate goal, to increase habitat for green jays, because in doing so, we'll also help every other bird species we have in the valley out. And that's, that's always a good thing. And there he goes. <laughs> this project was funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife Restoration Program. It was not comfortable, but it was one of the best ways to get around. With modern cars, we're spoiled by rides that are perfectly smooth, quiet, and climate controlled. We've often heard people say, well, the past was simpler times. And I think this provides some perspective on that. Welcome to Fanthorpe Inn. We turn a faucet and hot water is there. We flush the toilet and waste goes away. We go to our thermostat if we're slightly uncomfortable. So this provides perspective. Um, and, and perhaps could change people's minds about how we view the past. There aren't a lot of stagecoach inns left. Banthorpe Inn is probably one of the best preserved stagecoach stops in all of Texas. It started off in uh, the early 1830s, uh, grew to a uh, rather large stagecoach inn in the 1850s, ceased operation in 1867. And what's so special about this place? It is a unique opportunity to walk into the past and see how people traveled, the types of accommodations that were available to folks, how people exchanged information and learned of what was happening. You can maybe get the tiniest glimpse of what life was like in the 19th century. Now, if you had more money, you could stay in a private room like what we have going down this hall. Henry Fanthorpe was an English immigrant uh, who was born in 1790, um, twice widowed, came to the United States, eventually settling in Texas marrying the daughter of a local landowner and establishing his family here. Fanthorpe Inn is an hour and a half drive north of Houston at the end of Main Street in the town of Anderson, Texas. Historically speaking, the town was situated on an old Spanish road known as La Bahia, one of the main arteries for travel back in the 19th century. They immediately started having guests because they're on a very busy road. As the inn grew in popularity, it would eventually become a stopping point for five different stagecoach lines. A uh, whip is a helpful tool for a stagecoach driver. They use the sound to direct their team. So we're always careful not to hit the team. Fanthorpe Inn is open Saturday and Sunday. The bed is a rope frame bed. Select Saturday, it's usually the second Saturday of the month, we offer stagecoach rides and that's what we're doing today. Here we go. Most people find it fun for the short time they're in it. 
this is on a paved street. It'd probably be more wobbly out on the trail. Even though it's just a 10 or 15 minute ride to feel the coach rock you back and forth, it gives us the opportunity to say, wow, I can really appreciate now what my ancestors had to endure. <laughs> We're here. That was fun. Welcome to Fanthorpe Inn. He stayed postmaster for only two years. I bet y'all can't guess what country that came from. England. New England. It came into Texas during a time when we were separate nations. In 1834, we were still Mexican territory. This inn has sat in Mexico, the Republic of Texas, the Confederate States of America, and the United States of America, and has never once been moved. Uh, so it has resided in four countries and never changed its location. And that's pretty remarkable to think about. There are lots of famous people through this area, like uh, Anson Jones, the last president of Texas, Sam Houston, of course. We're not far from Washington on the Brazos, which is in 1836, where Texans declared independence from Mexico on March the 2nd. Of course, Henry Fanthorpe had already established his home here. So there are a lot of very important events that occurred here that still have a footprint on what we are today. The creak of a floor, the waviness when you look through the glass window, the smell of wood that permeates the building, the cicadas right now, all of that sort of adds to this experience where if you just closed your eyes, you could almost hear someone clapping along to a song and boots shuffling across the floor. It's those things that I enjoy thinking about that we can experience something similar to what they did. So if you're really looking for something unique, you want to give your kids uh, an experience of a lifetime. You can ride a stage, stand where Sam Houston stood. There's just so much unique history associated with the inn and the Fanthorpe family. It's just worth a visit. Along the edge of the Texas Panhandle, you'll find the Matador Wildlife Management Area, a colorful land of rolling plains and canyons spanning over 28,000 acres. The beauty and balance of this natural landscape is maintained by the regular use of an ancient tool, fire. On this spring morning, a crew of wildland fire specialists huddles for their 8 a.m. meeting. And Derek Maloney, who is Derek, you got lined out on how to operate everything on that piece of equipment? Especially. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes, sir. <laughs> I mean, if you don't know something, ask. It's our job to make sure we communicate the information to you, but it's your job to make sure you understand it. All joking aside, these fire veterans, along with a few new recruits, are about to conduct some serious business. Today's job is a prescribed burn. Right now, they're preparing to light a test fire. It gives us a pretty good indication of what the fire behavior is going to be like. It's going to burn slow. And since it's a test, if it doesn't work out, we can put the fire out and go for it another day. Prescribed fire mimics the wildfires that shaped and sustained this landscape over thousands of years. Fire is a natural process that has occurred forever out here. Whenever you don't have fire, brush encroaches. 
The more brush there is, the higher the fire danger is going to be during a dry year. So the more fire you put on the ground, the less the effects of a wildfire will be and the more controllable it'll be. But prescribed fire isn't just for controlling wildfires. Fire knocks back invasive plants and returns nutrients to the soil. This promotes native species and helps create a balance of cover and forage for wildlife. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and send one torch on. For burns as big as this one, the department assembles a large crew to complete the work. The person in charge of the fire is called the burn boss. Burn boss, Wayne. Go ahead. They oversee all personnel on the farm. All right, copy that. Next come the engine bosses, Squad one. who drive the fire trucks and direct crews. Anybody in charge of the firing operation that actually lights the fires, they're called the firing boss. Five to seven person hand crews do the mop up work once the fire burns through. Squad bosses are in charge of the UTVs with sprayers. And then there's the entry level firefighter. They do all the grunt work and make everyone else look good. Stand by for 11 o'clock weather. Temperature is 64 degrees. Relative humidity is 41 percent. Down 11. Probability of ignition is 30 percent. Up 10. Right there, that tells us where the humidity dropping and things kind of improving. Well, this fire activity is going to increase a little bit. It's going to move a little bit better. We started out this morning with uh, one foot flame lengths. Now we're looking at two to three foot flame lengths and a little bit more fire behavior. The fire is gaining and moving. So warmer temperatures, warmer fuels, the sun does that job. A little bit more wind, it helps spread the fire. But uh, check the IAP, it's just safe. And then just start dripping it along the inside right or from the roof? Yep, just right there. Yeah, that's fine. Along with the natural benefits of the work, these burns also help foster the next generation of fire professionals. That stuff lights up like real quick. Those fires hot. Everybody's working together as a team. I find that really awesome. Everybody's calling things over the radio. You got lookouts, people with the drip torches setting stuff on fire, people making sure there's no spot fires. It's making me want to pursue it more as a career every second I'm here. Let's take it over here, right here. We'll it's been a real treat, a really good experience. Some of these guys have been doing this longer than I've been alive, which is just kind of hard to believe. I'm feeling tired, like I'm going to need a few days rest before I think about coming out here again. Prescribed fire is a great habitat management tool. Every time we do a fire, I feel like we're taking a big chunk out of our management of that area. And then when you come back three months later and you have all this tall grass and you have all the wildflowers out there, it just kind of brings it all together and you realize what you've accomplished. This project was funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife Restoration Program.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve.